Welcome to today's CBI 10 webinar. My name is Kerry Thomas. I'm an editor at a new startup called Tortoise um, and looking forward to doing these webinars with the CBI again um, in 2021. This, of course, is only the second um, CBI 10 of 2021. And between the first webinar on uh, Monday morning and this morning, we've already had a dramatic change and, and a really quite difficult one for business. So like me, you probably watched Boris Johnson make the announcement on Monday evening that England is going back into full lockdown, something very similar to what we had from March to July last year. And of course that came just a few hours after Nicola Sturgeon had made a pretty similar announcement in Scotland and Wales and Northern Ireland were already there or thereabouts. Um, and then as night follows day, we had uh, the Chancellor stumping up some cash yesterday to try to offset some of the worst effects of lockdown, but it's clear that the sums, sums are getting smaller. It's relatively tightly focused support on certain sectors, and there's still big question marks out there over how long that support is gonna last. So I think it's that combination of things that we're gonna talk about today. Um, the lockdown measures which have been introduced um, and the financial support for business which accompanies them. Um, and I think more than ever, because all this is so new, um, it'll help me, it'll help the CBI tremendously if we can hear as much as possible from you on this call to reflect on, um, you know, how, how your business is going to, uh, how your business is contemplating the next few months. We heard Boris Johnson say that the most difficult times of the pandemic are ahead of us. I think he was, he seemed mostly to be referring to public health in that, but I think it's probably true for business too. And although we can see the cavalry coming over the hill in the shape of the vaccine, um, is that going to be enough to, uh, to, to, to make sure that your company pulls through? Is the support that Rishi Sunak announced yesterday enough to make a difference? Um, those are the things I think we'll want your help with this morning. So do, do fire any questions, comments, thoughts. Um, I think you know the drill by now, the chat is there. Um, put in a question, if you want to submit it anonymously, then just write a non in, at the top of it and we will treat that in confidence, of course. Um, we've got a treat this morning, not one, but three senior people from the CBI to help us wrap our heads around all this. We've got Rain Newton-Smith, uh, CBI's chief economist. Uh, we've got Tracy Black, who's the director of CBI in Scotland, and we've got Annie Gascoigne, who's the director of economic, uh, economic policy for the CBI. Um, welcome all. We'll um, come to you all in due time, as ever. Rain with you. I should mention actually, um, this um, the sharp eyed among you may have spotted. This is not the session that's advertised. I think we're going to we're intending to talk about Brexit. We would, of course, you know, come back to that. Um, uh, we're absolutely bound to. Um, so we'll let you know when that one gets rescheduled um, as soon as we can. Um, but Rain, um, good to see you again. Yeah, good morning. Nice to see you, Kerry. So I think I mentioned in just in really broad terms, um, the new restrictions that have come in and the support measures of business that have come in to accompany them. Um, can you sort of fill in some of the gaps I've left and just remind us exactly what's been announced and where all that leaves us? Yeah, and look, I hope everyone did manage to get a, a bit of a break over uh, the Christmas holidays because it certainly feels like it's uh, back to work with an incredible bump for so many, uh, so many of us. Um, so look, maybe I will start with Brexit actually, because while that we had planned to to really do a deep dive on on the New Deal and and uh, how that was affecting uh, trade, I think we thought with the tighter restrictions we saw announced uh, in England and of course across the devolved nations that we really needed to focus on what that meant uh, for the outlook. We're so it's so important that we hear from businesses um, about how this is impacting your own business plans, what support we need. We saw some more announcements uh, from the Chancellor, uh, but it won't surprise you to say that we don't think uh, it's enough. We were very much worried about a crunch time uh, in March anyway, and uh, this has definitely made things more challenging over, over the coming weeks. Um, but I think starting, first of all, uh, with Brexit, of course, we did get the deal on, on Christmas Eve, which must just be about the last chance uh, saloon. Now, I don't think it was quite the Christmas present we were all uh, hoping for, uh, but look, having that deal so much better than the alternative of, of no deal. So at least uh, we escaped that. Um, and as we know, there's still so much uh, to work on. It is uh, tariff free, um, but there are still huge challenges around rules of origin. Um, and how that will work in practice uh, over the coming months for goods. Uh, and of course, uh, across services, the deal is relatively light. We have till the end of March to 
uh, the, both sides have agreed they will work till the end of March to agree what sort of uh, equivalents there will be for financial services. But of course, there's a huge range of detail to be worked out about how mutual recognition of rules and how that works across uh, wider services. So that is something, of course, we will be uh, working hard with the government on and getting the views uh, from business. And uh, Tony Danker has already uh, attended meetings with Michael Gove and those regular meetings to feed in um, how Brexit is impacting on business uh, will absolutely uh, continue. And definitely recommend that <laughs> everyone head to our Brexit transition hub as well. If you want more details on how the deal is working, you can also get in touch with our uh, Brexit team. Uh, I think there's almost 2,000 pages for everyone uh, to digest, uh, but we are here uh, to help you work through that. And we will have some of our future webinars uh, doing a deep dive uh, on that. But look, beyond Brexit, I think all eyes this week have been around uh, the tighter uh, restrictions. Um, uh, and of course, we heard on, on Monday night um, that we'd see tighter restrictions and, and schools and, and colleges uh, across England will close. Uh, I, for one, have four kids on Zoom meetings, uh, Zoom Google Classrooms, uh, two behind me, two upstairs, my husband downstairs. Uh, what could possibly go wrong? So you might see some of them at some stage. Uh, and if my bandwidth goes, you know exactly why it is. Um, but I think even with that, there are, you know, some positives. I think schools are a, are a bit better geared up to providing some of that online learning. Uh, than they were before. But I think uh, working parents uh, throughout the land uh, are definitely feeling a bit beleaguered uh, already um, because it has such an impact on, on people's uh, working lives. Um, but I think everyone also recognises um, that, you know, this pandemic is unfortunately in the UK at the moment uh, going to get worse before it gets better. Uh, and we absolutely, we do know when we look at countries around the world, if we get the health crisis under control, uh, the economic recovery is far more sustainable. So it's so important uh, that we get, um, that people follow these restrictions uh, and that we really get uh, the health crisis uh, tackled and, and dealt with. Um, but I think, you know, it was also helpful to see that the Chancellor did uh, provide some support uh, yesterday uh, for businesses. So there's an increase in some of the direct grants via local authorities to, to retail hospitality and leisure who've had to close their doors. But I know many businesses will say the overall amount is still very low. And yes, there is some uh, additional discretionary grants. It's not going to in any way account for the lost revenue that businesses are facing. And I think one of the things that we really have on our minds is all the businesses who haven't had any support uh, so far because they're in the supply chains of some of these businesses uh, that are closed. We've had a lot of uh, businesses in touch already and we really need to people hear people's stories um, and how it is affecting their business. It is those stories that actually really help to, to win the case, I think, in our discussions uh, with Treasury and, and uh, wider government. The other area really uh, concerned around aviation. Uh, obviously, we've seen restrictions now on international travel, uh, and we're now seeing volumes, understandably, uh, around 10% of what they would be normally. Uh, that's a huge hit, not just to our airlines, but of course, the airports themselves and the whole ecosystem that sits uh, around them. And I think that is one area where we haven't seen, uh, by any means, adequate uh, government support, given the uh, challenges that that sector is facing. And we want to make sure that once we do recover from this crisis, and I think having the positive news on the vaccine is so encouraging, um, that we have all the infrastructure in place that we need to recover uh, quickly. And aviation and other forms of, of transport is just, you know, one illustration um, of that. Um, and I think, you know, the other thing that many businesses are also facing uh, you know, more and more now is staff absences and, uh, you know, managing people who are self-isolating. Um, and I think the strain on, on mental health is something that's very much on our, on our minds and, and we're sort of keen to, to share uh, the best practice uh, around that. Um, but I think I, I'll maybe just pause and finish with the sort of positive outlook on, on the vaccine. I think we've seen 1.3 million people already vaccinated uh, in the UK. There's only a couple of countries who have been more successful so far. Uh, Israel is, is the sort of world leader in being able to vaccinate a um, number of people, uh, the overall number of uh, people vaccinated uh, per 100,000. Uh, but the UK is, is quickly behind. And obviously, the 
good news about the Oxford vaccine uh, having been approved as it's now being rolled out quickly and the government uh, hope to have uh, you know all the sort of older older people and, and vulnerable people uh, vaccinated by mid-feb. We've had a lot of businesses offering as much help and support to, for that to happen as effectively as possible, offering facilities uh, for that to happen and that is where I think we all need uh, to pull together because the sooner we can get that vaccine uh, to as wide uh, a number of people as possible, the sooner our economy can get back on its feet. Yeah, um, I can see actually, Ray, we've got a lot of questions coming in already from people who work in the supply chains around retail, hospitality and leisure um, about the sort of, and we'll turn to those later. Um, but even even for those people who are in a position to, 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 to get one of these grants, it's a maximum of £9,000. So you can be a hotel with 100 bedrooms, can't you? And still the maximum you can yeah. apply is, is, is £9,000. And that's really not a lot, is it? No, it, it really isn't. And, and I think that's why we really think that what the government needs to do is come back to uh, some of the tools that they used before around VAT, deferrals around if you think about it you know businesses generate so much tax revenue but at the moment they are now facing a huge pressure on their cash flow uh, and so I think we again need to see the government to step in to take some of that um, pressure on cash flow onto the government's balance sheet to help businesses through uh, what is going, still going to be a really really tough uh, at least three months and let's hope it doesn't last a bit beyond that but I think we have to be prepared that we could be in in uh you know facing restrictions uh beyond easter even if that's not what we want so we need government support that is resilient to a range of scenarios yeah and, and rain quickly before i bring tracy in and annie in uh, i think your last sort of formal forecast was um 10th of december somewhere around there what does what does the announcement this week or, or the announcements this week what do they do to your your forecast do you think well, I think we released our forecast just uh, back in December and then, you know, we now still expect to see the economy as a whole shrink about 11% uh, last year. But this year we sh we had expected to see growth of around 5%. Um, and I think and most of that recovery was driven by household spending. Um, uh, but the real challenge is, is unemployment peaking um, just over 7%. And I think the challenge is now is that with the restrictions that we've seen, uh, you know, our estimates is that uh, reduced GDP growth in November, if we're talking about the, the lockdown we saw back in November, by about 5%. I think we'll probably see something about a hit to GDP uh, in January of around 5 to 10%. Uh, and of course, the real question is how long do these restrictions last? So I think, I don't think we'll get necessarily be able to achieve five percent growth as a whole uh, this year now because my sense is we're going to see uh, a much bigger hit to q1 uh, than we had anticipated of course if the vaccine rollout is successful then we could well see um you know us recovering that lost output in the second half of this year but my sense is it's going to take a bit longer than that um and we could you know hopefully we won't We'll see the overall size of the economy back to what it was pre-pandemic, maybe by the end of next year. I think the profile is is really difficult. I think what we all hope for is once that vaccine is rolled out, maybe we will have the roaring 20s uh, and that sort of uh, exuberance. But what I really, really hope is that we don't see a Great Depression uh, afterwards. I don't think we will because we don't have those, that sort of long term overhang. Um, uh, but what we have to hope is we have a smooth release of the restrictions uh, so that we can get growth on a much more uh, sustainable path. Great. Ray, thank you. We'll come back to you. Um, but let me turn that to Tracy Black, uh, Director of CBI in Scotland. Um, Tracy, good morning. Morning. Um, I, I think over the last sort of nine or ten months, I suppose, now of the pandemic, there have been moments when, um, when England and Scotland particularly have been sort of closer or further apart in policy terms. How, how do they look, how do the two countries look to you now in that sort of, on that spectrum? I think, you know, the fact is the whole of Scotland is pretty much closed now, similar to down south, but there are still differences in policies. The most uh, obvious one, I think, is in the schools and early years education, for example. Uh, in England, nurseries uh, provision is still there. In Scotland, that has been closed down. And I think most parents, including myself, would recognise, you know, a teenager is fairly self-sufficient, but a two-year-old or a four-year-old, you know, has to be looked after. So those sort of decisions put huge pressures on families for people who have to go out to work. Um, 
And, and of course, we still don't know the ramifications, long term ramifications for the young people involved and what it will mean to their opportunities. But I think, you know, what what business is really looking at now is is you know, what do they need to be doing to protect their staff and their customers? They're fully aware that this uh, variant is, is much more contagious. So this week, for example, I've been getting asked a lot of questions about it. Uh, the good news is I had a great conversation with NHS Scotland and Scottish Government who sort of have these five asks of business, if you like. And so what we've been sort of saying to members this week is because we're very keen to make sure that manufacturing and construction, for example, stay open, is look at your practices that you've put in place. Are they as robust as they, they need to be? Has complacency set in? You know, do you need to improve things? The second one is around ventilation. A lot of companies haven't really been sort of pushed on this, but the NHS Scotland are really saying, you know, even opening a window by two inches can make a huge difference. But if you do have a, a sort of professional ventilation system, you know, when was the last time the filters were changed or, or cleaned out. Car sharing is something that the test and protect system in Scotland is really seeing as a hot spot. Uh, and these points obviously apply to the whole of the UK and really asking employers to say to their staff that you should not be sharing a car with anyone apart from your immediate household. And, that, and that's not just going to and from work, but that's if you've got to go to sites during the day, it might mean taking multiple vehicles or vans, but really asking that people don't share vehicles. And then the other one is around face masks and covering. We know they can be effective. Now, obviously, this is only if it's safe to do so in your job. And obviously, you need employee uh, support on this. But again, NHS Scotland sort of saying, you know, if you could wear face masks, particularly in those hot spots around the building, you know, when you're going to the loo or you're going out to the car park, you know, maybe encourage. And we know some of our members are giving out free reusable face masks, for example, to their staff. So I think there's a lot of focus in Scotland around just how can we make sure that business isn't also being responsible for spreading the virus? What measures could they take to, to keep everybody safe? And I think some of that practical advice is going down really well with our members. Okay. Um, Tracy, I'm sure you've got your ear pretty closely to the ground in Scotland. I'm looking at the questions that are coming in on, on the chat, and there's a degree of something close to anguish about how businesses are going to get through the next few months. What have you been hearing from your, from your members about, about how, they're, how, they're, you know, how they're feeling in the wake of those announcements on Monday? Well, I think it's it's just, you know, what a start to the year. It's just, you know, we keep talking about feeling as if we're on this enormous hamster wheel. Uh, and yes, we get good news about the vaccinations, but we know that sort of what we call vaccination sort of dividend is it, going to take months possibly to come in. I think, you know, People absolutely acknowledge that the UK government and Scottish government, you know, have done some huge support packages, the GRS, the bounce back loans. But what was so effective about them was the speed that they came in and how they were delivered. And in recent months, what we're seeing is that there's a real frustration. We get these big headline numbers, but it's actually how long does it take for that money to actually flow into business bank accounts? So you get told on the 2nd of January, bank holiday in Scotland, that your business is shutting down again, potentially, you know, the next day or, or having real uh, changes to your business. And of course, we've got an extra layer. The Chancellor makes announcement. It then gets passed over to Kate Forbes, the finance secretary in Scotland, who then passes it on to the 32 local authorities who then have to design the system and put the rules in place. And then business has to figure out how to access it. So I think a lot of frustration there. The sums are not coming through. And there's also what we've ended up with is a myriad of grants and support schemes. It's really complicated. So I think what members would like to see is simplified how you actually apply and possibly a consolidation of some of those grants. Great. OK, Tracy, thank you. Um, Annie, as I mentioned, um, Boris Johnson said on Monday that we're heading into what may be the most difficult period of, of, of pandemic but it did seem at the time that he was thinking mostly about the public health aspects rather than, than business when he said that do you think the most difficult days for business are likely to be ahead of us as well well so in some respects i think you know we've been here before the lockdown restrictions um are, are very similar um to to what we saw in march um, and therefore the impact on, on the businesses that are closed are potentially um, of a similar order of magnitude. Although I think uh, the caveats to that are uh, clearly that businesses are more prepared. Um, I think it is true that there are there is now COVID secure guidance in place that we didn't see last March, which means that more businesses are able to continue operating 
um, through the course of this lockdown, particularly as Tracy said, manufacturing and construction feeling much more confident. But I do think, um, as, as Tracy also said, that many businesses will be reassessing um, their safety procedures. Um, but I think what, what is clear is that businesses um, are less able to weather this storm this time round um, than they were last time um, because for a number of reasons. First of all, uh, we've had 2020, which is just an intermittent disruption to demand uh, across the country. Some areas of the country affected more than others because they've been in lockdown uh, for longer periods of time than others or, or higher tier restrictions when we were in the tiering system. And that intermittent demand has affected cash flow. Um, so the last data we had from the ONS shows that around 30% uh, of firms were reporting that they had less than three months uh, cash reserves uh, to get them through, um, which is elevated levels uh, of firms in that category from, from where we were in August uh, last year and, and um, the months prior to that when, when that question was first asked. So the cash position of businesses is certainly weaker. Um, the other thing you've got to take into consideration is the level of indebtedness. So I think you know the bounce back loans, the coronavirus business interruption loans, all of the uh, all of the access to finance schemes that have been introduced introduced nationally um, have been really really effective for firms at getting through. But that does mean that leverage ratios have really shifted. Uh, so there's much more uh, focus on corporate debt uh, than equity than there was pre crisis, and some firms. Um, really over leveraged and, and needing to, to rebalance those ratios. Um, and I think that means that um, we can't necessarily look at the playbook that was used for March and say we'll just do the same thing again because the fundamentals of, of businesses have changed. And I think the third area, as Rain said, is uh, staff absences, morale uh, and uh, productivity is, is a different picture to where we were uh, back in March, yes, we've all got used to doing doing Zoom and uh, and uh, Microsoft Teams and all those uh, joyous technologies. Um, but also, there are increased staff absences because of track and trace, because of um, uh, increased mass testing, uh, which means there's increased staff absence. But also, you know, the schools closing, we know that affects um, people's you know working families' ability to to continue to work remotely. Um, and of course, there's the, the morale implications having uh, been uh, in this situation for, for such a long time now that I think many firms are grappling with. Um, so I think a combination of those factors means that firms are, are struggling in a different way um, than they were back in March. And so when we look at the economic policy response to that, we need to take those into consideration when designing uh, you know, support uh, for businesses through this period. Right. Okay, Annie, thank you. Um, let's let's turn to the question of supply chains because it's been a big theme in the come in. I, I could have taken a question from Keith Warren or Andy also or Simon Berry, who's the MD of English Lakes Hotel. They're all making the same point as as Bernard Taylor, who says we're a business in the supply chain for the hospitality sector. We are again faced with a zero income situation. While cash cash reserves helped us through 2020, they're now gone. There seems to be no support for our business, although we have taken advantage of the JRS. How are we expected to survive, or indeed, will we survive? Um, Rain, I suspect that's not untypical mm. of people that, uh, that, that Bernard Taylor is talking about. Uh, it, would the government's answer to that be that people in the supply chain for retail, hospitality, leisure are expected to apply for these discretionary grants that councils have access to? Which is, Would that be the, the formal position? I think they probably they would point to the discretionary grants, but they would probably also point to the other, you know, big uh, building blocks of, of support. So one, of course, is is furlough where demand is so weak that you're not able uh, or you don't need to produce. You, you have the option uh, to furlough staff. Now, that is open uh, until the end of April. And I think what we are pushing for is given where we are now, we need to have clear line of sight that that will continue at least till the end of, of Q2. Um, that's so important for how businesses plan. It's so important for individuals uh, who are obviously really anxious uh, in this period. We need to reap the investment of, of that support that has been 
uh, in place. So having that in place till the end of Q2 and then uh, some sort of taper uh, beyond that just seems to be appropriate from where we are now. Um, the second uh, mechanism the government would point to is, is the loan uh, and the lending schemes that are available. But I have complete sympathy with manufacturers in supply chains to the really hard hit sectors because the challenge is they haven't had any business rates uh, relief at all. They haven't had any of the uh, direct uh, grants that were provided for anyone who had a rateable property, a high street shop, uh, et cetera. And, but their business has been hugely impacted. So we are absolutely going to be going back to Treasury and say, look, when, um, particularly when you think about March, that business rates relief uh, ends for hospitality and leisure at the moment. Um, we think we will we should need to see some form of support i think and some form of uh, relief for that sector beyond march but i think it needs to be targeted right we probably don't need to be providing that relief anymore to essential retailers right they have been uh, the lifeblood of of getting uh, food and drink to to all of us but their businesses have been doing well uh, beyond that but what we should see is some targeted business rates relief for those who who have been really impacted and will continue to be and manufacturers aviation um, uh, and hospitality and leisure who will who may still be closed beyond that point is absolutely in uh, in our sights um, and I think we also need to come back to this question about VAT uh, deferrals and and whether there's uh, the potential to allow VAT to be paid back over a longer period of time or, or deferring a, a potential uh, another quarter just to alleviate some of the cash flow uh, issues uh, we are facing and there's probably more that could be do it, could be done on how loans uh, are repaid but I think we really want to amplify I think the voice of some of the manufacturers and people in supply chains uh, who've been really impacted my sense is their voice have, haven't been heard uh, enough so far uh, and we really need to make sure that that their voices are heard well and I guess ring you know we gave the government credit for acting fairly quickly uh, and acting in, on, on, at scale in the early days of the pandemic. But, but is it open to criticism for not subsequently then tweaking the schemes that it introduced? Because actually there, there haven't been big changes. The, the kind of fresh targeting that you're talking about doesn't seem to have happened very much, does it? Yeah, and I think, look, I, I can see the challenges uh, the government are facing. And in some sense, the dilemma is between using an existing scheme, which you have now, you've put in the groundwork to having it set up uh, and running. And anything that is automatically uh, dispersed is obviously easier to get the money to the people who need it uh, quickly. And we've seen that a little bit with the grants, right? The automatic grants from local authorities that were based on, you know, whether you had a high street shop um, or a premise which had to shut being able to give an automatic grant was easy to reach those people. Once it's discretionary, you need to have, uh, you know, rules. How do you apply? What, you know, how how hard hit has your business been? That means somebody has to sit there uh, and make those decisions as to who should get those rewards. And that makes it a lot harder uh, to get the money quickly. So I think the dilemma has been using existing mechanisms which are open to as, what, as many people as possible. And, as, and therefore you have the advantage of speed. You can hopefully get that money uh, to the business or individuals who need it as quickly as possible. Once you start to need to target it, it does become uh, more difficult. But our sense is the government really need to invest in that, thinking about how they can target business rates relief post-March. That thinking needs to be done now so businesses can have clarity uh, as to what will be in place uh, post-March. And I think that's just one illustration of some of the targeting we need to see. Yeah, and, and Tracy, the other thing that Bernard Taylor mentioned in that question was was the problem of, of having burnt through cash reserves, understandably. Presumably that's something that, that, that you see in the in CBI members that you talk to in Scotland as well. Yeah, absolutely. Like it's one situation where, you know, whether you're a business in Glasgow or in Bristol, it's really it's, the experience is exactly the, the same. Um, and I think Annie put it really well. It's, it's that month after month of of piling on the pressure you know you haven't had a consistent run with your customers you haven't had uh you know you haven't been able to plan you haven't been able to budget you haven't been able to improve you know your equipment anything you know it, it's just been you know stuck like in the mud for for nine months and a year and, and people are tired. I think, you know, normally in Scotland, you wake up on the 2nd of January, we need an extra bank holiday because we're partying so hard. You know, we needed the extra bank holiday this year because everybody's knackered, quite frankly. And so I just think people emotionally, mentally, physically, everything 
uh, really, really tired, and that is the management and the staff. And it's really hard for these businesses to sort of go, come on, put our shoulders back, let's get back out there, when you really don't know you know, when you're really going to see that real optimism come back. And I think with this crisis, what we always have to keep remembering is it's all about people. It's whether it's about protecting lives, protecting jobs, protecting your customer base. It's all about people. And and for us, you know, I think one of the things and, and why people are asking so much now, it's all about testing and vaccinations. You know, in Scotland, you've got a lot of companies looking at private testing, but actually our private testing still doesn't link into the test and protect system. And yet we know that could be a really good thing that business could do. Vaccinations, we saw a great announcement by Waitrose yesterday that they're going to provide a facility for testing. Again, this is a massive endeavor for the NHS, where can the private sector help? Is it providing advice to employees, but maybe it's centres, but it all comes down to, to people and that cash flow is not going to improve until customers are back and production lines are back up to full capacity and people feel safe again. It's, it's yeah. really challenging. Um, Tracy, let me stay with you because I've had a question in um, pointed in your direction from Gordon Nelson of the FNB, just while, while, while we're looking at sort of gaps in support, um, so, um, Gordon, who, uh, who um, looked over the construction sector, um, obviously construction works in many ways can continue, but, but Gordon is wondering whether there is a specific gap within domestic, a lot of people work in domestic settings where they're only allowed in Scotland now, I think in England too, to, to work on essential maintenance. Um, so he wonders whether there's a gap in support for people who would normally work inside other people's houses and now can't and whether that's something that's on your radar. Yeah, no, absolutely. And it was raised. I had a call with the, Fiona Hislop, the Cabinet Secretary for the Economy, on Monday, and we did, and she did reiterate exactly that, that, you know, up to Christmas, you know, trades could come into the house, um, you know, and, and it was booming. There was no doubt about it. We, you know, people were getting their houses decorated. They were doing home improvements. Uh, but now from, from this week, absolutely, it's only essential, you know, if your boilers burst sort of thing. Um, and that will have a huge impact on the self-employed, of course, because, um, you know, many of those trades are either small SMEs or, or, or sole traders. Um, and I think that is what Rain's saying. You know, we, we've had these very sort of firm sector sort of support. I think now when, you know, the whole economy is affected, you know, it has to be looked at, you know, has your business been adversely affected because of COVID, not because of your poor mismanagement? And if you can prove that your business is directly affected from COVID, you should be compensated for it. And, and we talked about this earlier uh, offline, but, you know, there's this difference between support and compensation. These are mandated closes, closures. And, and this isn't about government doing business favours. You know, the fact is they're being directly affected, quite rightly. You know, we need to protect people's health. So it's essential that these tough measures come in. But at, at the moment, the money does not come anywhere close to the losses that those businesses are, are facing. Yeah, um, I think we, we want to talk a little bit about the cliff edges that are coming up, because I think that's, a, that's an area that CBI is concerned about. And, and touching on that, let me come to you, Annie, because we've had a, a question in about um, C-bills, um, a loan that is due to start repayments interest charges from, from May this year. Um, how can we repay these with virtually zero income for suppliers to the event industry? Um, What's, do you see any signs of movement from the government on, on the sort of on the repayment date for, for C bills and uh, CL bills? Um, so, I mean, there has been some movement in the sense that we know um, at the winter economy statement um, last last year now uh, that the chancellor announced um, the kind of pay as you grow scheme for the bounce back loans and, and also extended um, the repayment uh, period. So allowed allowed lenders to extend the repayment uh, periods for, for C-bills. What we are hearing though is that that discretion on the C-bills is challenging because it's ultimately down to the lenders. It, it's not automatic in the way that the, the bounce back loans has been extended from six to 10 years. It, it's ultimately uh, down to an application process. So I think uh, something more automatic on uh, extending the repayment periods for, for C-bills, so spreading those uh, those loans over a longer repayment period and perhaps even beyond 10 years. That's certainly something that we're exploring with the sector, you know, the financial services sector uh, uh, about how that can help. 
Um, I think also the interest free period is coming to an end. Um, and so um, the government, so previously the government has obviously paid um, interest costs on those loans um, and that's coming to an end in March. And, and I think that March crunch point was really uh, important and something that we were discussing a lot pre-Christmas. Some, some of that March crunch point has been eased with the extension of the uh, job retention scheme uh, and some other measures, but definitely on the loans, it's still there. So I think we're also exploring what can be done on the interest uh, free period. But I think there are some other things around um, actually introducing uh, pretty rapidly the successor scheme to, to the coronavirus business interruption loan scheme, uh, making sure that's available uh, to non-bank lenders, so non-traditional uh, lenders, which actually makes that makes those loan schemes more accessible to more firms. So I think there are a number of things that government can really do. Uh, and I think the other thing is is thinking about where those um, where firms are heavily indebted, coming back to this question uh, about recapitalization. It's something that was discussed last year, but never really got a lot of traction because the focus was on, well, let's make sure that those loans that can be repaid get repaid. But we know now uh, that that is becoming a, a really critical issue as, as these um, loans start to be repaid and, and some firms just cannot afford it. Some can uh, and those, those loans should be repaid. So getting the balance between ensuring those that can be repaid do get repaid, but providing an easement uh, to ensure that, that we address that kind of over uh, overly uh, debt burden firms is, is something that needs to come back to. So that's something that the CBI is working very closely uh, with the Treasury, um, the Bank of England, the British Business Bank and others on. I'm not sure that a solution is currently uh, presenting itself very strongly, but it's something that we're definitely, definitely pushing. I think will be a focus for us over, over the next month to get that in place. Okay, well, let's stay with that question of cliff edges, because I think it's, it's really important. I know the CBI is, is sort of hot on it. Um, we had a question in or a point in really from Sina as well. He said that for retail, hospitality and leisure, extension of the eviction protection and winding the up order protection beyond March is critical. Otherwise, you'll get delayed rent payments and March quarter rent will push many high street businesses to insolvency in April. The cliff edge has to be removed. Um, Rain, is it, would it be fair to say that the, the, too often it's appeared that the government has got too close to the cliff edge before it's taken action that the CBI has been urging on them? Um, and I suppose, allied to that, can you just remind us what the, what the big cliff edges are that are still out there? Yeah, so I, I think if if we think about the main cliff edges at, at the moment, the furlough scheme is there till the end of uh, end of April. But obviously, you know, if businesses are making uh, decisions around jobs, if there's a much, you know, they need a consult 45 day consultation period with employees. So. Uh, you know, look, businesses need to know now what will happen uh, after April, uh, and certainly they're going to need to know uh, ahead of the, the budget. So I think that's a real challenge is, is smoothing that cliff edge in terms of what job support will be available at the end of April. The other big one is, is around, as you were saying, around business rates. Uh, hos hospitality, leisure and retail have had exemptions from uh, their business rates bill for the past year. Next, you know, this year from April, they will be uh, eligible for the, the bill for the um, uh, the next fiscal year. Uh, and I think we do need to see that smooth, but I think it's got to be targeted, right? As I was saying before, uh, I think we need to take essential retail uh, out of that because they've generally um, uh, done well and are able to to absolutely pay their their tax liabilities. But I think businesses that are closed or are and 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 for us, it's also we should see that targeted relief to manufacturers who are supplying into uh, those sectors because they've had no relief from business rates uh, at all. And we know that more generally, the whole business rate system needs fundamental reform anyway. It definitely makes it much harder for businesses with a, a physical presence. <laughs> so that's the other uh, big cliff edge. And then the other one that um, Annie was also talking about is, is repayment of, of those loans at the moment that those interest payments uh, kick in from uh, the end of March. And what we are work what UK finance and we are working with a proposal uh, with government is that those repayments shouldn't start until we should have a six month delay on those uh, repayments, because I think wherever we are, it's still going to be pretty tough for businesses uh, going into that. And if we can delay some of those repayments into the 
into the autumn, that's going to provide vital uh, breathing space to business. So that's another uh, cliff edge that we really need to, to see smoothed. And do you count VAT deferrals in that bracket as well? Yeah, so um, I mean, Annie may want to come on to the the uh, our sort of latest thinking around uh, VAT deferrals. But again, it's about smoothing the the repayments. There is some capacity around time to pay where you can go to HMRC and say, I, you know, my business has been really impacted. I can't pay all of my tax liabilities. But actually, we know from the first uh, quarter that VAT. Um, uh, deferral was actually one of the the support that the huge range of businesses used because it was so such an easy way of helping their cash flow um, and this is about cash flow this doesn't mean that these businesses aren't paying back this liability overall this is just smoothing that repayment and giving uh, businesses more time but I don't know Annie if you wanted to add any of our uh, thinking around that as well um, yeah, I mean, I just, I just make two points. I think um, the the VAT cliff edge is is clearly that uh, what the government have done is that they've said instead of having to repay that kind of uh, March to June VAT that you may have deferred um, from 2020 all in one instalment, um, you know, in March April time, that actually you can spread that over 11 11 equal payments over 2021. Um, however, that means that you know businesses are having to start repaying um, some of that money now on top of their either monthly or quarterly VAT bills that they have to pay anyway. Um, so there's a, there's a question there about that kind of hangover deferral, which starts to kick in uh, very soon. But then I think there's another question about, well, well do we need further deferral of, of other VAT payments that are due between um, now and, and perhaps the end of March or even end of April um, across the board? So that's VAT that will have been collected in the last couple of months or so um, on behalf of, of customers that, that is now due. And I think that's the important thing about VAT. This is tax that businesses collect on behalf of their customers and then pay to, to HMRC. This is uh, this is not their tax bill, but what the VAT deferral does do is it allows that cash to stay within the business um, so that they can continue to pay other essential costs um, as they're, they're kind of shut down. But then that is due later on. I think the other thing I would say about VAT deferrals and, and tax deferrals more generally, uh, the government has done those on an interest free basis. I mean, usually when a, when a company, you know, in normal times, uh, defers tax payments because they've gone into financial difficulty, there are interest uh, payments due and, and that has been um, waived in, in the instance of this crisis. That must continue uh, to be the case. We can't revert to the case where uh, where businesses are accruing quite high levels of interest. In fact, the interest rates um, charged on tax deferrals are, are much higher than prevailing uh, rates, of, uh, rates of interest charged on, on private lending to firms. Um, just because of the, the nature that the, that the government doesn't want to encourage uh, firms to do that as a way to, to borrow cheaply, of course, in normal times. But that interest-free uh, rate needs to continue uh, for any deferrals that, can, that continue to happen throughout 2021. So there's a combination of things, I think, that, that we need to look at again, uh, because there are some sort of big liabilities that, that are potentially coming in at a time when uh, firms, a lot of firms really don't have a lot of income. Uh, coming in and I think I think that's key. Yeah okay Look, we're getting towards the end. Uh, Tracy can I come back to you for what may be the final word here? Um, I, I mean I guess we saw Boris Johnson holding out rather timidly the prospect of a return to normal life from the middle of February onwards. I, I don't think a lot of people think that's particularly realistic. Um, if you were planning um, for when the lockdown measures might start to be eased. What, what 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 date would you have in mind as a realistic target for when things might start to get better? I've never wanted to think of myself as a clairvoyant, but if uh, certainly from my uh, members, there seems to be a sort of general sort of chat around May June. Now I don't know if that's because that's the best two months for weather in Scotland, um, but there's certainly this feeling that sort of Q1 is definitely is just going to be more of the same. Um, and I think this, this, certainly that's the, in, in our sense here is it will really not kick in until Q2 and probably more like the May, June period of time where, as I say, uh, life gets quite rosy in Scotland. Uh, it's the best time to visit us. So hopefully uh, tourism will be uh, reopened. Um, but I just I, I just think the first three months are, are a goner, really. All right. 
Okay, well, listen, that's not a great note to end on, but... Um, uh, <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Annie and Wayne, thank you so much for helping us uh, get our heads around this. Um, the next CBI at 10 webinar, of course, is next Monday. We look forward to your company there. But for today, um, thanks so much for joining us and we'll see you soon.